So Brian, how can my real estate photography business grow and stay on the cutting edge? You need to start using hdphotohub.com. All you do is upload your photos and your clients get a property website, social media flyers, and videos all automatically. That sounds pretty good. So how do I get started? Well, it's pretty easy, Rich. All you do is register at hdphotohub.com. If you use the referral code shooting spaces, you get your first property marketing kit absolutely free. Free? I did say free. Okay. HD Photo Hub is where great photos become a powerful marketing kit. Again, that's hdphotohub.com. Welcome to Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Discussions on gear, technique, industry news, and interviews with the best in the business. Now, here are your hosts, Rich Baum and Brian Berkowitz. Hello and welcome to Shooting Spaces. This is Brian from New York. And Rich Baum from Sacramento, California. And we want to thank you for tuning in for another fantastic episode. Springtime is here, Rich, and I know you are nonstop with your twilights left and right. Um, you know, I'm not going to quite say nonstop, but it's gotten, uh, it went from one or one or two a week max, and now it's, it's um, five a week. So yeah, it's uh, because the weather's been getting nice. It's five a week beautiful. is not nonstop? Uh, no, actually... <laughs> uh, seven to seven and nine i think is my my uh, record i know chris miller does mornings and evenings so wow, yeah that, there's a lot of possibilities and i got i got one uh, morning and and evening um next week so you know it's it's just part of it and it's it's great but man i'm uh i'm just getting home at at 9 30 and then i'm editing till one and then it's that time of year but i'm i'm getting compensated i'm happy i uh, no complaints that's all part of the game, okay. right? And what about you? Are you uh, rocking and rolling? Yeah, I mean, this week had a slow week. Um, I know, uh, the, you know, the schools are out with uh, the holiday and all that. So um, it is what it is, but it picks up again once everything is back to normal and uh, go full force into May. So it's uh, it's yeah. going to pick up again. I had a slow week, a uh, week and a half or so, but I'm working on some big commercial projects. So awesome. Um, awesome. hopefully those all pan out and, um, you know, we'll see. Take it, take it day by day. And I got weddings starting. Um, oh, that's right. Two weeks. I'm I, every weekend for three months. So anyway, that's uh, I'm not complaining. <laughs> nonstop. Yeah, pretty much. So you can you can you can uh, leave your wedding, run, <laughs> get a twilight in, and then come back. Huh? I'm gonna have to figure something out, but no worries. I'll I'll get it done. So so as we what do we have going on today? Today, we have an incredible interview that I've been looking forward to for a while, as I'm sure many of our listeners are probably looking forward to listening today. But I want to uh, introduce our guest. Our guest is Brandon Cooper, who is now, I guess, as of, I guess, the first of the year, I guess you can correct me, Brandon, if I'm wrong, the new official owner of PFRE. So welcome, Brandon. Thanks for coming on. And uh, why don't you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks a lot for having me, guys. Um, not really sure what you want to know, but I'm a, I'm a real estate photographer based up in Fort McMurray, Alberta, Canada, which I don't even know what you guys know where Calgary is by any chance. I got a horse, I got a rodeo, something up there. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> yeah, and you so, got Indians uh, and rodeos and Eskimos and things like yeah. that. So most people consider Calgary North and I'm located about 10 hours North of Calgary. So some people can't really fathom that, but. Uh, it's a crazy little town, about 80,000 people, five hours from the closest city, and we basically are, are run by oil. Our whole entire industry is oil, so our, uh, our community is very tran transient, and there's a lot of turnover in the real estate, so it keeps me real busy. So are you, uh, are you a photographer of the, the lights, the northern lights? Do you see those up there? And You get a, oh, yeah, a lot of those? Them. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't spend a lot of time shooting them because usually the best time to shoot those is when it's minus 40 and three o'clock in the morning. So I like to get my work done during the day shooting homes, but there is, there's actually, um, oh yeah, there's, I mean, there's a guy out of, uh, used to live in, in the Yukon. I'm not sure. I think he's in the, in the East coast now, but he's kind of world renowned, uh, Canadian photographer named Dave Brosha. If you look him up, some of his photos of the, the Northern lights are just spectacular. It's something, you know, I've seen in my whole life. So it's one of those things that they never really get old. They're super cool. But if you haven't seen them, there's really no way to explain them. They, you know, they change colors, they dance, they, they make different sounds. It's pretty amazing. So they're there, but I just watch them. I don't usually shoot them. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So Brandon, um, 
there's a lot to talk about obviously with the with pfre was i correct was it january 1st of this year 2019 when you officially switched over or well so we actually we actually did the deal larry and i officially january of 2018 but then the plan was because i wasn't in a position to take over and and start handling the day-to-day posting and all that kind of stuff plus i knew it was going to require a a fairly lengthy transition period because there's a lot of stuff behind the scenes that i need to learn so january 2018 we did the deal i kept larry on um basically on salary doing the day-to-day posting and I kind of took over some of the business development and, and just working on some of the stuff that I wanted to get going on behind the scenes. And then April, was it April? Yeah. April 1st uh, of this year, we did the official transition. So Larry has stepped away completely. And then as of April one, I'm kind of responsible for everything. Ah, so it's been a f- only a couple of weeks at this point. Yeah. A couple, not, not, not even. And, and I've been out of town pretty much the whole time. So it's been a bit of a challenge, but it's also fun. Hey, um, let me ask you a question because I, I, I don't want to put the, uh, the cart in front of the horse. I want to make sure that give us your canned, your elevator uh, pitch. What is PFRE, uh, Photography for Real Estate? What is it? Tell the people that don't know. Uh, it's basically, I mean, in a nutshell, it's a resource for real estate photographers around the world to basically come together, share best practices, learn from one another. And then again, you know, once a day, five days a week, we try to put out a a post that provides some value and helps educate people. So I think more than anything, uh, over the last 15 years, um, you know, essentially it's a blog, but more than anything, it's, it's really a community. There's, there's thousands of people that visit the site every day. uh, And there's a lot of relationships that have been developed through the blog for, you know, 10, 12, 14 years, lots of people that know each other online but have never had an opportunity to meet in person. So it, in a nutshell, I would say it's a community of online, uh, an online community of real estate photographers. Mm-hmm. And it's in, how does that link up with Flickr? Because that's how I really uh, found out about uh, PFRE. Yeah. So I don't even know when it was started, but Larry started a Flickr group years ago uh, where you could post a couple of your own photos. And as that group grew, I think, don't quote me on it. I think we're up to about, 12,000, 12,500 members. Um, and you can post a couple photos each day and then it gives an opportunity for others in the, in the group or in the community to comment, provide feedback, get feedback from folks. And it was actually, you know, <clears throat> excuse me. It was, um, the Flickr group was a huge part of my early career. Uh, at first I, I was a little shy to even post in the group. And then as I got a bit more confident, I started posting my own photos, getting some feedback some feedback more valuable than others. And then it just kind of grew from there. So I, I lived it myself. I went through that, that whole process of, uh, you know, gaining the confidence to post photos, start getting some feedback and then eventually start providing some feedback for other photographers. And it's become a really good place to sort of cut your teeth and sort of hone your skills. So um, I don't know, there's something like 42 or 43,000 photos in that Flickr group now. And like I said, about a little over 12,000 people. So it's a great place to post your photos, ask for feedback, provide feedback. And again, like I said earlier, um, sort of share best practices. So are you going to, are you going to take over where um, <laughs> Larry used to always come in? And if you, one great thing about uh, the Flickr group is you've got to add lighting, an explanation of your photo of lighting explanation or whatever. Um, and the details of your photo. And if you don't do that, Larry comes in and comments, hey, you got to do that. And uh, you do it or you, you get it kick, kicked off. And I love that idea. I actually have that for my uh, one of my Facebook groups. But are you going to be taking over that? That because it always seemed like a full time job to me. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, definitely we want to maintain <laughs> that type of sort of control because obviously there's a lot of value in, in people. Um, Yes, posting the photo and you explaining how they lit it and all that kind of stuff. So the, the goal will obviously be to keep, keep that up. Um, Scott Hargis is also an, an admin on the Flickr group and he does a great job of sort of chiming in every once in a while. Um, but definitely I will be stepping in there to sort of uh, check it on a more regular basis. There's a lot. Um, if I'm being totally honest, there's a lot on my plate right now. Like I said, I knew this was going to be a long transition and it would be challenging. I never in a million years realized how many details were actually at play behind the scenes of PFRE. So it's a bit of a a learning experience for myself, but it's been fun. And again, it's just a matter of figuring out all those little challenges and finding ways to manage them. And and yeah, that's the plan moving forward. 
Yeah, never would we have thought that it would be so much work. But uh, it's we love it, and it's uh, you're doing a great thing. I, I got to recommend that anybody who's in the Facebook groups and it, to for sure check out the Flickr group, and uh, it's just a really great. Oh, and the searching abilities are really great there. You can find whatever you need by searching um, in the Flickr group. So it's it's wonderful, and you have a a blog, and and it's just. What's the plans for the blog? Um, what's oh, are you going to keep it the same, same look? Are you doing any changes? Anything you can tell us about that? Yeah, sure. I mean, for the most part, we, we don't want to change too much. I mean, the reason the blog has grown so much over the years is because people got value of it or from it, basically from day one. So, um, you know, it's it's essentially been sort of one man's opinion five days a week for 15 years. And Larry has done an incredible job of building that blog, building that community, sharing information. And, and I mean, if you could see the emails that we get on a daily basis from people that have been affected by the blog and by Larry's uh, help over the years, it, it's pretty incredible. So the only thing, if I were to say that we're going to maybe change, and it's not really a change, it's more of just a pivot in a bit of a different direction, is I would like to make it more of a sort of a platform more of a collaborative opportunity for people who want to contribute to the industry and to the community and share their information. You know, I'm Larry was a master at getting questions, doing research, distilling that information that he would research down to a good answer and then communicating it back to the community. I'm a little more, um, my approach is more like if someone were to, to, to ask me a question about say social media and I, and I'm not super, super savvy in that area. I'm the kind of guy that's going to reach out, find some, an expert in that area, pose the question to them, ask them to provide some information back, and then ultimately they can post the information to the community. So, again, going back, going from sort of one man's um, opinion five days a week to opening up to anybody out there who has value to add to the community, wants to share. Some people are at a point in their career where they just want to give back to the community. They want to help um, beginning photographers in all kinds of different areas, whether it be you know, how to get better photos, how to do lighting, how to run your business, how to promote yourself. It just, you know, there's a, a wide variety of, of, of different types of information out there that people need to learn about. So, um, yeah, that's the biggest thing is changing it to be a bit more collaborative. And then ultimately, one of my number one priorities right now is to sort of update the image and, and uh, the design of the actual appearance of the blog. I, you know, my, my, my goal here in the next year or so is to get the image and look of the blog to match sort of the the rich content and history of Kifari because we've got 15 years of history 32 some 3200 posts give or take uh, and again lots of people have kind of come up through the ranks so i just want to make sure that for those folks who are just getting into the business now uh, if they stumble across pfre online they they don't sort of dismiss it because it looks a little bit dated. I want them to see it, recognize it, stick around, and spend some time going through the historical posts and really realize how much of a powerful resource that it really is. Well, I think that's that's crucial. You know, you're talking about historical posts because you've been around so long. There's such a wealth of information there. You know, and Rich, you touched upon it with the search feature earlier. You can find almost anything you need to look for, or or any topic remotely related to this industry, some way or another on the. Uh, on the PFRE blog. So yeah, you know, like you said, you know, a post from 10 years ago, even the content might be a little dated at this point, but there is something out there. So um, yeah, to be able to make sure no matter what you're doing, that, that, that wealth of information is always going to be there for people is crucial. Yeah, for sure. And, and one of the neat things that, you know, if you're, especially if you're new coming into the, in into the industry, you know, if you go on PFRE and you search for a topic like lighting, for example, it's going to pull up a whole bunch of articles. But if you click on one article and start reading it, that article is more than likely going to have links to other articles around the same topic, but different people answering different questions. And it can send you down that, you know, that rabbit hole that, that I'm sure we've all been sucked into on YouTube and stuff like that, where you ask one question, and the next thing you know, you know, you're three hours later watching videos. It's the same kind of concept on PFRE. You can, yeah, you can go back and it's an old dated article. Maybe it's 10 years old, but there is value too also in seeing the evolution of that topic going from 10 years ago to what people are talking about today. So it's interesting. So at the end of the day, again, 
lots of information out there and, and um, I just want to make sure that the, the image and the design and the look and feel of PFRE matches that, that rich history and content. And I, I want to say one thing about, about what I have found to be the, the most, for me, the most helpful thing with uh, the, and I go back again to the PFRE uh, Flickr group, is um, I think it's super, super helpful and important for people to identify, and whether you're doing it in Facebook or on, online or in periodicals or whatever, but find photographers that you like the look of what they're doing, what they're putting out. Then you can go through each of the images and you can see their lighting setups or you can find common denominators, things that you start going, ah, I see what he's doing here. And you can learn so much and you can literally go through someone like Scott Hargis's photos for years and see what he was doing 15 years ago and then follow it through and just uh, and see and find out and, and see what he says about each image or what he's comments about things you should look for and things you should watch out for. So it's a, it's a whole nother level than uh, the Facebook groups. It's uh, something that I urge everybody to really spend the time there. And I also want to say, um, if I don't know if we mentioned it, we had uh, interviewed Larry Lorman, uh, one of our first interviews, what was the first, second or third interview? Yeah, it was in the top uh, five, I think, something like that. Yeah, and Larry came on and we felt it was really important to, um, you know, was, we were both thinking of who should we interview, who should we bring on, and the legacy comes goes down to uh, certain people and one of them is uh, Larry. And it was really uh, informative and great, but I'm just glad that we could bring you on and, and you know, you're passing the torch on. It's kind of fun, it's kind of exciting to see what's going on and, and very hopeful about things and yeah, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, I appreciate that too. It's been, I'm, I'm glad to come on and talk about it. And like you said, Larry, I mean, no question asked. He's, he's a pioneer in this industry. If you could hear some of the stories I've heard from him over the, the last few years of how this whole thing came to be, actually, now that you mention it, it would probably be a great opportunity to write a, a story or, a, or an article on sort of the history of PFRE and how it came to be. Cause it really is, it's the definition of sort of a grassroots, effort. Larry never set out to build this big thing and never set out to make a name for himself. He was just trying to help people early on. People caught on to that and it, and it just kind of built from there. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. And so I just wanted to go back to, to a point you were making about the Flickr group and being able to go through people's history. You know, when you, for, for those photographers out there who are relatively new, kind of just getting going, there is a huge amount of inspiration to be found. Um, when you find a photographer, and, I, and I, I don't know if I should be out in anybody, but I think about someone like a Barry McKenzie, and I look back at his work even just, let's call it six years ago. I think he was PFR Photographer of the Year in 2014. So what's that, five years ago? Mm -hmm. No, he was 2015, I believe. Anyhow, you look at his work just four years ago, five years ago, compared to today, and th this guy is on another level he is so unbelievable and so folks out there who might be struggling or they're a little bit frustrated um maybe they've hit a plateau and they're not getting to that next level you look at someone who's gone leaps and bounds in four or five years it's exciting because then you realize man there's more out there maybe i'm struggling right now but it's just because i'm not necessarily asking the right questions or i haven't found that opportunity to learn from somebody um so it's very exciting and the other side of that too a thing that exists now that didn't exist even three or four years ago, at least in my experience, is the ability to reach out to these individuals and just ask for help. I mean, I reached out to so many guys back in the day, four or five years ago, just saying, hey, I will do anything. I just want to learn. I love your style. Help me learn. You know, Tony Colangelo, perfect example. He, he's, he's been my coach for four years now. He turned me down, I think, five times when I first reached out because he was just too busy. But without question starting to work with him was the biggest decision and the most beneficial thing that I'd ever done for my, for my photography and then also for my business. So that's another thing I just want to sort of throw out there to, to, to early photographers or anyone out there that's feeling a little bit stuck is if there's someone out there that inspires you, don't hesitate to just reach out and ask for help. You'd be super surprised how many people are willing to offer their help to you. It's, it's very true. Every so often somebody might send me, uh, an email. So <laughs> I, I got to tell you, man, I get, I get so many, so many emails and comments and it's so true. You, you nailed it on the head. There are just tons of great people out there that are happy to give out their information and, 
And uh, yeah, I really appreciate the, that what you guys are doing too. Yeah. So Brandon, let me ask you, you just mentioned it briefly um, with the photographer of the year and the contests for, for new listeners that are listening. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about those contests and what they are? I know you have, you have monthly contests and you have yearly contests and uh, let's go into that a little bit. Sure. Yeah. Every, so, so each month we do two contests. We have a photo still contest and we have a video contest. Each month has a different theme for the fo- for the photo side of things. Um, And then at the end of the year, anyone who has won a monthly contest basically gets nominated for photographer of the year. And the same jury, there's 10 jurors that vote on each monthly contest. The same jurors that vote on those end up voting on photographer of the year at the end of the year. And then we name, so we'll name 11 photographer of the months throughout the year. And then at the end of the year, we'll we'll name photographer of the year. And it's kind of cool too. If you look back, we've got all the history on the site. And if you look back at some of the names who have either won monthly contests or been named photographer of the year, you look at where they were there compared to where they are now. I mean, there's just an amazing list of talented guys like, you know, Ethan Tweedy, Barry McKenzie, Jason Rayner, Wayne Capilli. I mean, the list just goes on and on. Michael Fave, all kinds of cool people. So we do that each month. Um, we get quite a bit of engagement last, last two months in a row, we've had 60 entries. Uh, one of them was from over 14 countries. I think we had a a few submissions from Africa and Spain and Italy. And so it's another great opportunity to submit your photos. And I would also, again, take this opportunity to encourage people to not be intimidated to enter the contest. Cause one of the best for me personally, in my own photography career, it was one of the best opportunities to get my photos out there and get some feedback from some really talented folks. So, um, yeah, the contests each month start on the 1st, they end on the 15th. We vote on them for a week, and we usually announce uh, the winners on the 23rd. And, um, yeah, again, the, the judges do – it is a volunteer position, obviously. We have 10 jurors who are all very talented in their own rights, And they do an amazing job volunteering their time to comment on as many photos as they can each month and provide feedback wherever they can. So it's just a cool thing to be part of. Yeah. And it's a great way to uh, get your work out there. And, uh, you know, I want to, you know, just kind of agree with you, what you said with uh, the submissions you got from Africa and Spain and all over. And it just goes to show the type of global reach your blog has. And, you know, that's something Rich and I didn't even realize when we started this podcast. Um, you know, we get also listeners from all over the world and you don't even realize till you go ahead and do it that, you know, nowadays with technology, the way it is, you know, you know, Rich and I record this podcast from our homes and literally we have people from all over the world listening, which is crazy. Yeah, it's crazy. It's totally crazy. And, and the thing that's cool about it too is this, I don't know where I heard this the other day and it's something, I mean, I don't think it's a huge surprise to anybody, but in this day and age with phones and cameras getting so good, it's not real difficult to take a decent photo anymore in terms, you know, from a technology standpoint, Um, you know, but this, this sort of subsection of our industry at photography in general, real estate and interiors and architectural photography, I think is one of the only areas of photography that's really growing. So, it's neat too to hear that you're you're you know you've got readership or listeners sort of from around the world. I mean, people are taking photos of homes in Africa to help sell them. It's it's just wild how this has all changed in the last few years. Very true, and it's very different around the world too. I've learned a lot uh, by not only traveling around the world, but by and, and looking at real estate um, things and windows. It just uh, how do they? How do their photographs change and differ from others? And it's very different around the world. But it's one thing in common. We're all kind of in the same group. So, yeah, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah, and that's the thing. It's very cool to see the differences and, and be able to share that. I mean, we, we, had, um, we did a workshop in, uh, in Ottawa uh, back a, a little over a year ago, and we had a, a gal there from Australia, and she was telling us that they provide six photos for their listings. Right, and what they yeah. charge for it is kind of double of the average that I was hearing from most folks that are shooting in North America. So, just that alone, I mean, I would never have guessed. What a crazy I, thing! I will add one thing though. Um, when I was in Australia last year, it's a hundred bucks for breakfast, a hundred bucks for lunch, and a hundred bucks for dinner. So it's all relevant. <laughs> Please, everybody needs to understand that when they hear that. Yeah. Uh, listen, I wanted to bring up one thing. You're you you are coming from. It's a little surprise. You're coming from 
a place and give us a hint of where you are, where you are speaking from at this moment. Yeah, so right now I'm in my hotel room in Las Vegas. I'm down here checking out venues for the PFRE conference. Ooh. And, um, you know, we haven't obviously shared a huge amount of information because we don't really have a huge amount of information other than the fact that we are 100% committed to making this happen. It just is a matter of figuring out the logistics and making sure that we can find a venue that will work. It's, it's a very, man, oh man, I'll tell you, a year ago when I started, I mean, it's kind of been a dream of mine for a few years now. But a year ago, I really dug in and said, I'm going to, I really want to make this happen. And so it's been a, a major, major learning experience figuring out not only what venue is feasible from a financial perspective, but what's going to provide the best experience for our, you know, our attendees and, and how to get the right content, good speakers, good vendors to attend, all that kind of stuff. Make sure it's affordable and reasonable for people to, to, get, to get here. We originally were looking at Chicago, and then um, we were looking at November, and then Chicago had that massive cold snap. And I thought, well, if I'm asking people to walk a few blocks outside for lunch, maybe Chicago's not the best idea in November because it could get cold. So I threw up a post on, on uh, PFRE and the, the general consensus was, hey, let's try and find somewhere a little bit warmer. So Vegas came to mind because it's, you know, it's not necessarily central, but it's easier to get to than a lot of places. Relatively cheap flights, lots of accommodations. The weather's pretty decent all year round, except for today. I got absolutely drenched, stuck in the rain because I took so many Ubers today that my credit card locked up because they thought it was stolen. Mm -hmm. And I literally got stuck outside in the rain for 45 minutes. Um, but yeah, that's where I'm at. I'm in Vegas checking out venues. I, and, and when I say I maxed out my, my Uber, well, I'm not maxed it out, but I mean, took so many Ubers, they, they, they canceled or they froze my card. I think I checked out 16 venues today wow. and, um, I'm pretty much an event location expert in Vegas now, I think. <laughs> so we're getting there. We don't have a huge amount of information to really share other than the fact that we're going to try and keep it central. The goal is to make sure that for year one, um, we make it as affordable as we possibly can. We may, you know, we provide as good a content as we possibly can. And we really want to open it up for as many people that want to come to make it possible for those folks and to handle as many of the logistics ahead of time as, as we can. So it's a challenge. We're making good progress. And I hope in the next two to three weeks, I've got a little more concrete information to sort of report back to the community. Yeah. I mean, you said, what's your obviously nothing set in stone but what's your what's your plan or what's your vision for this is it to have vendors kind of like an exhibition hall with vendors and then have speakers um go along that route yeah so you know i'll be totally transparent right now when it for the division of this whole thing has changed so much since the initial concept a lot of that has to do with logistics and just trying to figure out how to manage everything but originally my plan was to have sort of a, a home base where we were going to have a, a, a large room or a large hall where we would have some speakers. And then we'd talk about doing some breakout sessions where we, where we could and, and sort of take that approach. Um, over time, finding venues, figuring out budgets, sourcing locations, all that kind of stuff where we're kind of at right now. And again, none of this is written in stone, so don't hold me to it, but, more than likely we're going to pick a one room venue uh, and we're going to have, I've already got some, I can't say who, but I've got some world-class speakers committed guys that are top of the top in our industry. I, I don't think there's a real estate photographer on earth who doesn't know who these, who these two guys are. Um, and I've got verbal commitments from them. Obviously it's subject to us firming up a location, all that kind of stuff. But for year one, we're going to have a one room venue with a handful of speakers we've got a lot of vendors who've been kind of knocking on the door saying hey you know we want to be involved uh, we just need to figure out the logistics of that how that works for them when it comes to involvement what exactly their involvement means whether it's just having a booth set up or if they're going to spend the weekend hanging out and making themselves available to, to answer questions and all that kind of stuff but in a nutshell it's going to be um, a handful of really good speakers a couple of interactive presentations with actual you know teaching um, real techniques and, and, and approaches to different areas of the business. Some of the speakers might just be inspirational from uh, maybe 
um, a success story perspective. And then we might have some folks there talking about social media and the business side of things. Um, and then, of course, we're going to have a party. We want to give everybody an opportunity to get together. And, you know, I don't know how many people are out there that have known each other online for 10 years but have never met in person. So we want to have a good a social aspect to it because I know, I mean, you guys have – Rich, you've done workshops. You, you've had people come from far and wide to, to join you for a workshop. And um, one of the biggest pieces of feedback that, that Tony and I have had from our workshops from day one has always been, you know, they, how much people love the opportunity to get together face to face, hang out, and finally put a face to a name that they've known for years online. So we want to make sure that we provide an opportunity for people to come to town, do it affordably learn as much as they can and be inspired over a day or two. And in the meantime, make a ton of new friends, foster some relationships that might already be there. And again, just bring the community closer, give people an opportunity to meet face to face. And, and my dream just straight up would be that this becomes an annual event that people just mark off in their calendar and they know that, Hey, you know what, whatever month it ends up being, they know that they're going to the PFRE conference and it becomes a staple and we go from there. And is it is there a possibility that it's going to be in um, 2019 or early 2020? Yeah, there is. Both of those, exactly. <laughs> so okay. my original plan was November uh, 2019. And then when Chicago took a bit of a right turn, I started thinking, man, maybe I should push it into February 2020 just to give, because I want to, I think part of it too is giving people as much notice as possible so they can plan from a financial perspective. And the other thing is we don't want to pull people out of their market uh, during a time where they're going to be making good money. So we need to pick a month that they're going to be slower, but we also need to pick a month where the resources are there. You know, early in the year is great from a scheduling perspective, but it's also following a couple slower months. So if I, you know, again, don't hold me to this, but I'm pushing hard. I really would like to see a November 2019 conference. Um, if not, the alternative is probably looking like a February 2020. Um, but I've got another full day of uh, meetings tomorrow here in Vegas, and I'm really hoping that by the end of next week, I come out of here and say I can say confidently, hey, we can pull this thing off in reasonable time and firm it up and make an announcement and get rocking. Fantastic. That sounds awesome. And uh, Brandon, as you know, we're here for you in any way we can help you from a shooting spaces perspective to get this going and get it out there to as many people as we can. We have a, a wide audience of listeners that listen to us, um, I guess, daily at this point. So let us know in any way we can help. We'd be glad to. Yeah, I sure appreciate that. And I'd love to find a way for you guys to be involved somehow when the actual event happens. You're going to, you know, in a dream scenario, we know for sure there's going to be some sort of heavy hitter speakers there, but I think we're also going to get a lot. I mean, it's going to be the only first time ever that a lot of folks in the community are in one place at one time. So you'd have an opportunity to talk to a lot of folks and it would be cool to just get some coverage from a, a podcast perspective. So I'd love to throw that out there for you guys to keep in mind. Oh yeah, we'll definitely be there. Rich and I talked about that already. We'll be there recording some podcasts for sure. Cool. And this will be exciting, Rich. I might be able to finally meet you face to face. I, you know, that's as, and I will say that's very true. I've been lucky to meet a lot of people and yeah, during my workshops, um, people just love being able to see what other people are using, what they're doing, talk about it, rap about it, because it's just, uh, it's not that possible when you're really, you're, you're not doing a lot of collaboration. So anyway, well, that's so wonderful. And I'm so, so excited about it because it's something I personally would really love to do and go out and check out regardless of any any um, way, shape, or form, I just want to be there. So it'll be fun. Cool. Well, yeah, we definitely, I mean, again, I, I want to make this an event where all those names that you've seen online for so many years are all going to be in one place and we can yeah. finally, because it's funny that you just said it. You guys haven't met in person, which, by the way, isn't always <laughs> an amazing, <laughs> amazing thing. <laughs> it, it, it's but, pretty funny, yeah. But, <laughs> but, but it's also... Again, there you go. That's a perfect example of how cool it would be to have everybody in one place. So, I'd also, too, while we're here, and I mean, I know you guys can cut this out of this if you want, but um, one of the biggest challenges that I'm facing while I organize this conference is I'm doing it all on my own. Not only, I mean, I have help, but I'm guessing about what people want to see. I'm guessing about what kind of venue they want. I'm guessing about even what they, what they could reasonably 
pay for two days of great content and, and all that kind of stuff. So if there was an opportunity to tap into your listenership somehow to, to just say, get people to give some feedback and, and just say, Hey, you know, I'd love to see this, or I'd hate to see that. Anything that the, the, the biggest help that I need right now is tapping into where people's, where people are at um, in their headspace when it comes to attending the event, because I've had a lot of people reach out. I mean, everyone I've talked to about it has says, yeah, I'll be there. But we all know when the time comes, it's a lot more difficult to execute, to, to pay the bill and book the flight, get the hotel, be away from your market for a couple of days. So I'd love to hear from people what's going to help make that as easy as the, um, easy on them as possible. And then what they're going to want to see when they're actually there. So sure. that- and yeah, on that note, I'll invite all our listeners to either email you directly, or if you want to email them to us, just send us some information, what you're looking for, any feedback you have, um, anything that Brandon's asking for, and Brandon will be glad to forward those over to you so you have an idea of um, what, what people out there and our listeners are looking for. Awesome. That'd be great. And um, I know we're, we're running low on time now, but uh, you know we want to thank you for coming on. I think this is very important for, for everyone out there, and every real estate photographer out there. Um, with this transition of PFRE to, you know, I guess, hear you, listen to you, know what your vision is for the blog and for, um, you know, the contest, the Flickr groups, you know, the, the conference coming up, everything. So, uh, you know, appreciate it. Appreciate your time and uh, looking forward to, uh, to a big conference day and this year. Well, thanks a lot, guys. I, I, I appreciate you guys. I appreciate what you're doing and uh, appreciate you having me on. And what's the uh, website again? For, for PFRA? Yeah. Photographyforrealestate.net or photographyforrealestate.com. Or if you just put it into the Google machine, you'll find it. There you go. Awesome. Correct. I mean, that's how I originally found it when I that's started learning. Yeah. <laughs> that's another interesting thing. There's never been a penny spent. It's been organic from day one. And that's part of what I loved about it from the minute I found it. Excellent. Good. Awesome. All right, Rich. Well, uh, that about wraps up another episode. Another one down in the books. Okay, man. Uh, tell us, what, are we, uh, what do we all want to do, Brian? Well, first, I want to just remind everyone, we do have a few spots left for our upcoming webinar. So if you have not yet registered, we do have some open spaces. We're filling up. We're limiting it to 100 people on Mastering Twilight Photography with Rich and Matthew Stallone. So you can go to shootingspaces.net slash Mastering Twilight to register for your spot. We're going live May 2nd at 9 30 p.m eastern so it'll be awesome you guys will be talking about your technique doing some live edits in photoshop we'll be there to answer questions so for uh, 60 90 minutes it's definitely an incredible value at a little under 30 bucks so yeah and it's going to be a lot of fun i'm really looking forward to it and matthew stallone and and we have two different two, two different styles of of twilight photography each with their own merits and you get to check it out and tons of you know, ask questions uh, you know anything you need to know um, Brian's going to be there fielding questions. It's going to be awesome. Fantastic. All right, great. Well, Rich, until next time. Until next time. Oh, wait, no. Ask the guys. We always say ask the guys. Guys, oh. send in your questions for Ask the Guys because we love that feature. 90 seconds, you can plug your company, ask your questions, and we'll, we'll answer them or get somebody else to answer them. We'll just make sure you get that information. But besides that, I just want to say thank you for subscribing. and. Go out there and shoot some spaces. This episode of Shooting Spaces has been brought to you by HDPhotoHub.com, helping your real estate photography business grow and stay on the cutting edge. Just upload your photos and your clients get a property website, social media flyers, and videos all automatically. Register today at HDPhotoHub.com using referral code Shooting Spaces to get your first property marketing kit absolutely free. HD Photo Hub is where great photos become a powerful marketing kit. Again, that's hdphotohub.com. This has been Shooting Spaces, a real estate photography podcast. Subscribe to the show and don't forget to leave us a review. You can also follow Rich and Brian on social media and at their website, shootingspacespodcast.com.